Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. In this video, I want to talk about the brow group of a field. And one way to think about what this object is, is it's a way of measuring the arithmetic complexity of a field. And the way we do that, interestingly enough, uses non-commutative algebras, and in particular, the theory of central simple algebras. Okay, so let's start with some motivation for the notion of the Brow group. So the way we'll do that is we'll start, of course, with a field. Uh, the Brow group actually works in more general contexts. Uh, this was introduced by Grotendieck, uh, but the original notion of the Brow group, of course, is much earlier than uh, in the case of the field. So we'll start in this simple case first. And we want to look at um, something that might be thought of as the arithmetic complexity of this field. Okay, so what does that mean? So in a sense, one way to think about that is, well, how uh, difficult is it to solve polynomial equations over that field? Okay, so if you're over an algebraically closed uh, field, okay, then you can always uh, find roots of um, polynomials. Okay, so in that sense, it's easy to solve. Uh, but uh, when you're far away from algebraically closed, that's not the case. So in a certain sense, uh, one can also think about arithmetic complexity as measuring how far away one is from being algebraically closed. And I guess uh, there are various ways you can try to measure this. Okay, So we want to measure this. And one way to do that is to look at the totality. What we're going to do is to look at the totality. So this might be the simplest way of thinking about these things. Okay, to look at the totality of these um, uh, field extensions f over k, uh, which are finite. Okay, so this is a finite field extension here. And so, what's the reason for that? Okay, so I guess one way to think about this is that if you have some alpha that's inside f but not inside k, then what you can do is you can look at uh, p of x equals the minimal polynomial of uh, this alpha um, over the, the smaller field k and this has no roots in k okay so uh, this minimal polynomial is one way to go back and forth between uh, finite field extensions and polynomials okay so the other way to think about this is that uh, you can look at um, uh, how far is something away from a field k away from its algebraic closure and of course the way you can do that is by looking at all these finite field extensions okay the totality of them okay now um, uh, this is fine but i guess there are lots and lots of finite field extensions of k in general and uh, how to, do you study this whole set of all these finite field extensions? Well, that's quite a tricky thing. And usually the best that one can do is one looks at Galois theory, okay, which studies the symmetry of um, the algebraic closure of uh, k uh, over k. And we look at the symmetry of that, so that's the Galois group, so called Galois group of that. Okay, and this uh, group is actually quite a complicated group um, in general. In, um, if k is close to k uh, algebraically closed or equal to it, of course, um, then it gets small or, or in the latter case trivial. Uh, but in general, it's an extremely complicated group. So if k is, for example, the field of rational numbers, this is a, a very, very important object in number theory. Okay, so that's the best way, to, I guess, to study this totality of finite field extensions. Okay, so what we're going to do instead now is uh, we're going to look instead at the totality of all finite uh, field extensions, um, f of k, we're going to look at d over k, where d over k now, d equals some central simple um, uh, k division ring. Okay, so we're going to allow non-commutative things instead, um, and we're going to assert that it has to be central. Okay, so okay, so that's something that we can certainly do, and um, you can see that in a certain sense it also measures the arithmetic complexity, how difficult it is to solve polynomial equations, because you can do exactly the same thing. Okay, you can pick some alpha inside d. And the key thing is that k, if you join alpha, then generates a field. 
okay it's going to be commutative okay so you can talk about its minimal polynomial as well and um, well that will give you uh, examples of things uh, 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 polynomials where which don't have roots inside the smaller field okay so you may think well why do you want to go to this more complicated setup here and the reason is the following okay the set of all finite field extensions is complicated and the best way to study it is using this complicated group called the Galois group okay what happens in this case here is a, a little bit interesting suppose you have another one another uh, d prime equals some um, k central and let's look more generally at simple algebra okay k central simple algebra the thing is that there's a way of combining these together you can take the tensor product of these two and one thing that we saw earlier in this playlist is this is also k central so this is the um, tensor product of a k is k central simple so the set of all these central simple k-algebras has this advantage over the set of all these finite field extensions in that there's some extra structure. You can combine two to get a new object in that class. Okay, so unfortunately you have to move out of division rings, okay, in general, and you look at more generally at k-central simple algebras. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to try to uh, use the set of all these central simple algebras to uh, measure the arithmetic complexity of a field so now we can finally define a brow group of a field okay so we need to introduce one concept first um, so we're going to consider two central simple k algebras okay so let's suppose we give them names okay suppose they're a and b and we're going to say when are they equivalent okay so I guess there's a various ways of saying it. So, uh, so that is, uh, we're, we're going to write A is equivalent to B. Essentially, if they're Morita equivalent. Okay. So if you don't know about Morita equivalence, the easiest way to write this is uh, in this case as follows. It just means that you can take matrix algebras in A of some size, the full matrix algebra. And that's going to be isomorphic to the full matrix algebra in B of some possibly different size M. Okay. So that's one way of looking at it. Um, if you're going to do this in terms of Wedderburn's theorem, what you can do is this is equivalent to the fact that writing, um, remember for any central simple algebra A, this is isomorphic to uh, say n by n matrices in some central division ring and b similarly say n by n matrices um, so these n and m won't line up with these n and m so maybe i'll change these to different letters and this db and this da are division rings have the da is isomorphic to db Okay, so uh, essentially remember in Wedderburn's theorem that um, these uh, central simple algebras, uh, they're all full matrix algebras in over some division ring, central simple uh, central uh, division ring. And so basically uh, the up to equivalence, okay, the set of all these uh, central simple algebras is just determined by the central division rings okay that's what this uh, is showing okay so i won't show you why these are equivalent um, but if you know the Morita theory then it's not too difficult to see that okay so now we can actually define the brow group of a field k it's going to be a commutative group okay and what's the underlying set okay so it's usually denoted brk and it's just the set of equivalence classes of central simple k algebras Okay, so if you have a central simple K algebra A, A, you can look at the equivalence class of that. Okay, so maybe A is a division ring. And then what you're looking at is just all things which are isomorphic to full matrix algebra in that division ring. Okay. And I guess to be a group, I also have to tell you how to multiply. So suppose you have another central simple algebra B. Okay, 
then I hope you can guess from the previous slide how we uh, do the multiplication. So you need some equivalence class of central simple k algebras. And so you just tensor these two over k, and you look at the equivalence class of that. And you can check that if you change the equivalence class of A, this on the right hand side, this equivalence class doesn't change either. Okay, so there's some things to check to show that this is a legitimate multiplication, but it does give you a multiplication. Okay, so um, that's rather nice. So let me just explain some things about this group structure. So it's nice that on this set, so it's a set, this uh, Brow K is essentially just the isomorphism classes of central um, K central division rings. Okay, but since uh, to form the multiplication, we take the tensor product, which means that we can get some central simple algebras. It's better to formulate this uh, Brow group in terms of equivalence classes of central simple algebras instead. Okay. Okay, so why is it a group? So we need to, to check some group axioms. So the first thing that I guess you should check is what's the unit? Okay, uh, and uh, so what's the unit? So here, uh, K is the unit because if you tensor uh, k over k of course that doesn't change the uh, vector space or the algebra in this case the other thing is that uh, the associate uh, the multiplication which here is essentially tensor should be associative and commutative and that we know is true is associative and commutative okay so I guess the last thing that we need to know about, and this is also the other reason why it's good to have uh, work with more general central simple algebras rather than just division rings, is the following. How do you get the inverse? Okay, how do you get the inverse? So that's rather interesting. And so remember one of the things that I showed you in this facts about central simple algebras, if you take a central simple algebra A and you tensor it over K with its opposite algebra, then this is isomorphic to just the endomorphisms, the k-endomorphisms of the vector space A. Okay, so that's just some full matrix algebra. Um, so that'll be uh, isomorphic to just a full matrix algebra, and the size of that will be just the dimension of that vector space A. Okay, and that turns out to be square. Okay, so that's the reason why this. Uh, Brouwer uh, group, this multiplication gives you a group structure. And it's precisely the fact that you have this extra multiplication and this group structure, which means that we can work with this invariant much more easily. So this is an invariant measuring the arithmetic complexity of the field K, and it's much easier to work with. Okay, so let's go through and look at the first interesting example, which is the Brouwer group of the reals. Okay, so what is the Brouwer group of the reals? Okay, so I guess you just need to look at all the R central uh, division rings. And how many are there? So we know of two. Okay, so firstly we have the reals itself. So that's a unit. Okay, so you need to have the unit in this group. And what else do we have? Okay, so we the complex numbers, remember, is a division ring and it's an R algebra, but it's not central over R. The center is all of C. So we don't include that one. But we do have the Hamiltonians. Okay. And it turns out that to, up to isomorphism, there are no other division uh, rings which are R central. And so that's all of them. And so you have a group with two elements. And so this has to be isomorphic to Z mod 2. Okay. So just some things that you might want to see um, from this. Okay. So you can see immediately. So the, the generator of this group is, of course, given by H. And let's just multiply it by itself. So it's order two. So when you take the uh, tensor product of R with itself, you should get the trivial element. So in this case, this will be uh, a full matrix algebra. Okay, so this is dimension four over R, four over R. So you get uh, dimension 16. So it's four by four matrices over R. And why is that true? So I guess one way to see why that's true is that, um, well, H is actually isomorphic to H opposite because you have this uh, quaternion conjugation, okay, which is an anti-isomorphism. And so that means that the opposite algebra is isomorphic to the original algebra. So you're just tensoring at the opposite algebra here. 
And then since the opposite algebra gives you the inverse in the Brow group, that tells you that the tensor product is of course trivial. Okay, so that's um, how this uh, group um, structure works. Okay, so that's the generator of this copy of Z mod two. Okay, so this is a theorem essentially due to Frobenius. Okay, and I want to give a straight sketch to you roughly why it's true. Okay. So, of course, um, we're going to start here with D. It's going to be some R central division ring, and it might be the reals. And we want to show that if it's not the reals, so we're going to assume it's not equal to R, then it has to be the Hamiltonians. Okay, that's what we're going to do. Okay, so it's not equal to R, so it contains an element which is not um, inside R. Okay, and the first thing I'm going to say is that it has to contain a copy of the complex numbers. Okay, so why is that? So what we're going to do is we're going to pick an alpha inside this D, and since it's not equal to R, we can pick it so it's not inside R. And the key point here is that, uh, so this implies that this R adjoint alpha uh, uh, is a subfield of D. Okay, a non-trivial extension of R, which is a subfield of D, okay, and it's of course finite because uh, D is finite dimensional over R, so that means that this is isomorphic to C. So D immediately contains a copy of C, which is good because the Hamiltonians contains, well, in fact, lots of copies of C, and you can see here there's lots of ways to get copies of C. Okay, so since it's got a copy of C, you can write there's an I in there, so let's put that I in there. Okay, so what are we going to do next? We're going to look at conjugation by I. So this is an element of this division ring. And we can look at conjugation by I. We'll call that sigma. So that's a map from D to D. Okay. And since uh, it's uh, R is central, it turns out this is a, um, a, a linear map, an R linear map from D to D. Okay. And so you can look at the eigenspaces. And I claim that the only eigenspaces are... Um, the plus and minus one eigenspaces, which we'll call d plus and d minus. Okay, so let's see why uh, these are the only eigenspaces that you get, and it's quite simple to see why that's true. What we're going to do is we're going to look at sigma squared. Okay, so what does sigma squared do? Okay, you input some x here, and you're going to conjugate by i first, so depending on how you want to do it, uh, maybe it's i inverse xi. And then you've got to conjugate by i again. So now you uh, multiply on the left by i to the minus 2 and i squared on the right. So that's equal to well, i to the minus 2. Okay, that's the inverse of what well, i squared is minus 1. It's minus 1 times x times minus 1. And remember minus 1 being a real and this is r central. Uh, we have an r central division ring. So that just equals x. So what's the sum total of what I've shown here is that sigma squared sends x to x. Sigma squared is just the identity. Sigma squared equals the identity. And since the sigma squared equals the identity, a little thought will show you that in fact um, d has to decompose as a direct sum of the plus and minus one eigenvalue. Okay. So the only possible eigenvalues have to uh, square to one. Okay, that's given by this relationship here, okay, and in fact, not only that, you have distinct uh, uh, eigenvalues, and this D is a direct sum of its uh, eigenspaces. Okay, so that's, that's, that's great uh, that you have this decomposition, so let's have a look at what D plus is. Okay, so D plus is all the things where conjugation by I um, multiplies by 1, so it doesn't change anything. Conjugation i does nothing means that you commute with i. Okay, so this is also the d plus equals centralizer of i. All the things that commute with i. And of course, since c is commutative, okay, we have a copy of c there, okay, so we'll fix this copy of c, by the way. We'll just pick one particular copy of c. Um, uh, fix that. Um, it con contains that copy of C, and I claim it doesn't contain anything else. If it contains something else inside here, so you have some beta inside here, okay, you can throw in this beta with this C, okay, and that will give you something that's still commutative, because beta commutes with all of C, 
and the field generated by C and beta, or the, the, the rather the ring generated by C and beta is inside D, so it's going to be a field extension of C, and of course there are no finite field extensions of C because C is algebraically closed. Okay, so it turns out that D plus has to equal C. Okay. Okay, so let's look at the other part. So remember, what does H equal? So H, one way to write down H is it equals C direct sum CJ. That's what we want to do. That's where we're getting. So we've got a C here, and that's the plus one eigenspace of conjugation by I. And I claim that this other part I want to match up with the minus one eigenspace of this uh, uh, sigma. Okay, so inside this D minus, I'm going to pick a non-zero J. Okay. So what am I going to do now? Okay, so I'm, I've clicked that non-zero J. And now I'm going to write uh, something. So firstly, this D is equal to the direct sum of D plus, direct sum D minus. And what I claim here is that firstly, if I multiply D plus by J, I'm inside D minus. And similarly, if I multiply D minus by J, I'm inside D plus. So right multiplication by J uh, will swap the these two eigenspaces. Okay, so why is uh, that the case? So if you think about this for a moment, uh, let me just kind of show you why. Maybe I'll change the color of this so that you can see what's going on. Let's suppose we look at this D plus times J, all the elements of this form. So this D plus is just C, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to conjugate um, an element inside here by i. So we have an i inverse on the left and i on the right. Well, what that is, is you just conjugate an element inside here first, which is multiplication by 1 because this is a plus 1 eigenspace, and you conjugate this um, element by i and you multiply them together, so that multiplies it by minus 1. So at the end of the day, you've just multiplied the product by minus 1. So that means that you're inside here. And similarly here, if you conjugate by i, okay, well, what it will do to the first term, it will just send it to its negative, and this j will send it to its negative. So the sum total on the product is that it's going to multiply by the square of minus 1, which is 1. So it ba basically, it's just in the plus 1 eigenspace. Okay. So that means that multiplication by j swaps these two things. Okay. And then it becomes pretty clear that this decomposition, what is this decomposition? Okay. This is really just what the D plus we saw is C. And since G, multiplication by J is a bijection, remember it's a non-zero element of this division ring, so it's invertible. So um, multiplication by J will send this over to here, so that's just CJ. Okay. And then what you can do is that um, you can now uh, see that it looks a lot like the Hamiltonians. And the only thing that you need to check is, uh, well, firstly, um, how does this J commute with C? Well, since it um, uh, conjugation by I is uh, axis minus one on this, um, the way J will commute through this is by conjugation. Okay, you can check that. And the other thing that you have to check is that J squared equals uh, minus one. So to do that, it may be the case that J does squared doesn't equal minus one because uh, we only have picked some J here which we can scale by any real number. And so the square will change by the square of that real number. But the point is that um, we can change this j, replace j with uh, alpha j to see j squared equals minus 1. Okay, So there's, it's possible to do that. I won't go through the proof of that. But that essentially gives you a proof of Frobenius theorem, which tells you that the Brouwer group of R is Z mod 2. Okay, so it's actually very important, and not just the fact that you know this has is a set with two elements, but also the structure. Although in this case, since it uh, is a group with two elements, the group structure is fairly clear. Okay, so for in this final slide, what I want to do is uh, tell you some ways that uh, the Brow group is an invariant, invariant telling you about arithmetic complexity. Okay, so I want to give you some. Um, results without proofs, um, but results which are very important. And these results concern the case where the Brouwer group is trivial. Okay, when is it trivial? Okay, so one time we know the Brouwer group is trivial is when k is finite. 
Okay, and this is a theorem due to Wedderburn. Okay, so note that for a finite field, it's not algebraically closed. Okay, but still, it's not that complicated arithmetically because its brow grip is trivial. Okay, so another case where the brow grip is trivial is when K is a finite field extension of this field here. Okay, so we can think of this as a function field of an algebraic curve over C. So it's just a finite field extension of C adjoined T. Okay, so this is um, rational functions in C. Okay, so in both these cases, the Brouwer group is trivial. And I want to give you some sense of what the implication of this is, so, or at least one implication. And this goes uses the relationship between projective conics and um, quaternion algebras. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to consider a projective conic. Okay, so maybe we're inside P2 of the field K, and we've got homogeneous variables X, Y, and Z. So it contains some conic, C, which is defined by some quadratic equation, homogeneous uh, form of degree 2. C, Q, X, Y, Z equals 0. So let's do a quick example. Um, um, K equals reals. And then you can look at x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 0. Okay, so in this case here, if you were to solve this for x, y, and z real, uh, the only uh, solution you get where, is where all of these x, y, and z are 0. Okay, so um, that's uh, not allowed to be a homogeneous coordinates for a point in the projective plane. So this has no real points, no, or are rational points, so to speak. And it turns out that that's because that this corresponds to the non-trivial element in the brow grip H. Okay, Whenever you have a projective conic, which doesn't have a rational point, okay, that will actually give you a central simple algebra um, and a, di a division ring, which gives you a two torsion element in the brow group okay so however the brow group in these two cases so if the brow group of k equals zero then every projective conic has a k rational point And in this case, you can see that uh, using stereographic projection um, is isomorphic to just a projective line uh, over that K. So that's in one way that this brow group tells you that arithmetically it's uh, simpler. Okay, So you can always find a, a non-trivial solution to this quadratic equation if K is either finite or a finite field extension of uh, C. T, the field of rational functions with complex coefficients. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.